Hi, this is Christopher Sutton, founder of Musical You, and welcome back to Beatles Month. Today I have the distinct pleasure of talking with not one, but four Beatles experts. Mike Moratori, Frank Moratori, John Orca, and Patrick Gannon, the members of Hard Day's Night. Hard Day's Night is among the top Beatles tribute groups performing in the US today. They're a full catalogue, touring Beatles tribute act that focuses on performing songs exactly as the Beatles themselves did. The band has performed on national television, at America's top Beatles festival, and at the Beatles' own Cavern Club in Liverpool, England. I was eager to find out what goes into being one of the top Beatles tribute acts in the world, and how the four members of the group think about the musicality of the Beatles. We talk about what exactly the members of Hard Day's Night would do to learn a new Beatles song note perfect, how performing as the Beatles compares to playing in a non-tribute band, and I ask, as four people who've studied and played the songs of the Beatles more carefully than almost anyone, why do they think the Beatles have had such a lasting impact over time? It was really cool to hear about how each member of the group came to love the Beatles and perform in Hard Day's Night, and how thoughtfully and carefully they approach their work in performing as the Fab Four. I think there is a lot to be learned here about musicianship that goes way beyond tribute bands or Beatles specifics, so please enjoy. My name's Christopher Sutton, and you're tuned in to Beatles Month at Musical U. Welcome to the show, Frank, Michael, John, and Patrick, the musical group known as Hard Day's Night. A big thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a lot of ground to cover here, and I'd love to start at the beginning with a little bit about where each of you are coming from as musicians. Maybe we can kick off with Frank, who plays the role of Paul in the band. Frank, how was your musical upbringing? Where did you get started in music? Well, my family's always been very musically uh, in tune. For example, my mother was a singer. And uh, as small children, we'd watch my mother in the local variety show at the, high, at the local high school do her uh, torch song, uh, Hard Hearted Hannah. And then she'd sing some ballads. And then at home, she could play the ukulele. So as we were little kids, we learned how to play the ukulele. And we did stuff like Five Foot Two, Eyes of Blue. But anyway, make long story short, uh, we listened to the radio a lot. And um, uh, we would sing. I had uh, three other brothers. So I was very fortunate to have a younger brother named John Murator, who was very musical. And both of us sort of gravitated together and would do, uh, we'd sing all kinds of songs. Even the Four Seasons came out. In the early 60s, we would sing some of their harmony stuff, trying to do that falsetto thing. But we really weren't impacted until the Beatles came out. One note that the rest of the family, all my brothers played band instruments at school. So my brother played clarinet, my other brother played the bassoon, I played the saxophone, and my younger brother, John, played trombone. So once the Beatles came out, uh, we immediately wanted to ditch those for guitars. And... <laughs> We, we did talk my mother into buying a guitar for Christmas. Uh, oh, I can't remember what year it was, but it was an acoustic guitar. And uh, we, we played around with that. We couldn't even play chords on it at first, but we learned how to play the bass notes. And it was about the time the monkeys were really big on TV, 1966 or 7, I can't remember. So we would learn to play like uh, I'm Not Your Stepping Stone with just the bass notes. We'd sing the harmony, stuff like that. And uh, it seemed like my brother John and I were the most... Um, by ear musicians of the family. We had probably the better harmony ear. So we continued that, and then finally we got band instruments. We played in the high school stage band with our guitar and bass. I played the bass, my brother played guitar. My brother and I had a band in high school uh, that uh, we, uh, this is where all the experimentation came in, and my father at that time bought us a tape recorder, a Sony tape recorder, that had sound on sound, so we could record double track. So what we would do is we'd start recording stuff and even make up songs. We started writing our own songs in high school. And uh, we would listen to ourselves on the recorder, and, you know, that's the first time you hear your own voice on a tape recorder, you're kind of shocked. Like, oh, my God, that's me? I thought I sounded better than that. So through trial and error, you know, we got a little bit better, and we found a couple guys at school, we formed a band, and we played all the dances at high school and uh, – then we ventured out into playing a bar before we were even age. Uh, we lied about our age. Back then, you could play anywhere. Um, yeah, and that was a real experience. And uh, the music uh, at that time, in the 70s, we were really into the bands like Santana, 
and the Almond Brothers. And these weren't the most popular bands that kids wanted to hear at school. I'll be honest with you. You know, they want Three Dog Night, uh, uh, the Doobie Brothers, that type of thing. So we would force our unfortunate audience had to listen to us jam on some of these Santana songs or Almond Brothers songs. <laughs> some, of them, some of them were like 15 minutes long. So during that jamming process, we, le we learned different things. Uh, my brother developed into a very good guitar player, John. And uh, so the band went around. We each wanted to have a solo during this jam, and and the audience was bored. I'll be honest with you, the audience didn't like it. <laughs> so, but uh, we did play enough top forty to keep being play, uh, hired at the, at the school. But that continued into college, where my uh, we played other bars, etc. And uh, we did Peter Frampton, that type of thing, more jamming. Uh, and through tape, we would tape ourselves occasionally and listen to it and figure out other ways to improve our our overall sound and what we were doing. So through trial and error, I think we picked up a lot of uh, help along the way. Uh, then my brother got interested in playing classical guitar and he actually left the band uh, when I was in college to pursue classical music as opposed to rock and roll. So that's pretty much my journey. And from there, um, I just continued from there with other bands, et cetera, until I got to the Beatle band. Gotcha. Interesting. And, I'm not sure many people would have guessed that someone who was so into the creative and experimental and jamming side of music growing up would go on to play in what some would consider one of the most rigid forms of music making, being in a, a tribute band and one that particularly prides itself on authenticity in terms of the music. How did that transition happen? Well, that's uh, when you said what what does a tribute band do to put themselves at the higher level of uh, the competition, for example, or, or to present themselves to the public as authentically as possible? This was a, this was also a learning process. Since I'm the I'm the oldest in the band, I, st I was in the original Hard Day's Night, which started in 1997, I think it was. And uh, yeah, I had to go back. 96. I had to go back and listen to all the records again to learn to play them correctly because I was not playing them correctly from my memory. So I had to study it. Uh, we did this by ear. I, I'm not, I can read music and I, from high school and stuff, but I'm not the best reader in the world, pretty much more of an ear musician. So I, I listened to it. We went over it and over and over it. And I have to be honest with you, it was an evolutionary process for me that took, took 15 years, I think, to be halfway decent. I mean, even though I was pretty good, to be as, um, accurate as I am today, it took a while. And then when I switched to play left-handed, the bass left-handed about eight years ago, 10 years ago, I can't remember how long now, uh, that was a another learning process. I kind of had to learn how to handle that instrument left-handed. I knew the note, uh, frets, fret placements, etc., but it took a while to get the coordination because when you're switching your hands, uh, the fingerboard wasn't such a problem with my right arm right hand it was the instant it was the picking action on my uh, left hand attacking the string that took a lot of work uh, coordination work but now i think i've developed into a pretty good player left-handed after 10 Tremendous. years <laughs> <laughs> and that's a change you made for the sake of authenticity right because left-handed. correct we noticed back 10 years ago whatever all the major beetle groups in the world their paul would play left-handed and I would play gigs right-handed for years, and people would say, oh, oh, you're really good, but boy, if you were left-handed, you'd really be good. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. Now, only a few people would say that, but I know that everybody else thought that too. And it's really funny because uh, now that we are successfully playing left-handed, I play left-handed, and you see other Beatle acts who are pretty high up in the food chain who don't play left-handed bass, in other words, the Paul's not left-handed, you go like, oh, the guy's not left-handed. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bias there. <laughs> When you're watching it, I guess. It makes a big difference on, on the stage because the way Paul and George got on the mic is yeah. very unique. Much, much more comfortable with that. So, and you got that sandwich, that look. When you look at the Beatles, you see the left-handed bass going out one way and then John Lennon's guitar is going out the other way and it just makes the frame of the picture match. It looks, uh, looks very good visually. Well, I'd love to dwell on it for a second because for someone who was already at a very successful level, to kind of handicap themselves in that way, it takes quite a lot of ego control, I think, to put yourself back <laughs> in those beginner shoes. And, you know, as you alluded to there, you kind of had a head start because your brain and your ears knew what to do. 
and your right hand, I guess, was quite nimble. But it, that must have been quite tough to kind of put yourself back a few notches in terms of your instrument skills. It was. I think you said something, I hate to admit, but the ego part of it is very important because, unfortunately, uh, people would come up to me and then my own band guys would challenge me as well. So I bought a lesser, a less expensive uh, Hofner, a Chinese Hofner, to start practicing on. And um, I, it was cheap enough where I'd leave it sit right there in the living room and I'd pick it up and play it every day. Every day I'd play this guitar. And it took a period of six months to be able to play the easy stuff. You know, the first set we would kind of strip down. I could play that stuff. And then the harder songs like Day Tripper, which you're playing on the seventh fret on, an e, on the A string, on the E on A, and you're going up with the, that riff from there. That's a little trickier. But after about a year or so, I got proficient enough to do that song. And from then on, I've been probably good enough to do all the songs. Um, uh, I've had no, no real trouble doing um, all those songs we're doing currently are just put that way. <laughs> I have those down. Nice. Well, I, I think it's a, a neat little case study in a way of something a lot of musicians, I'm sure, can relate to where you want to make a great leap forwards, but you need to be willing to kind of take a step or two back to be able to do it. And you're going to have to be willing to put in the work, even if you're trusting that the payoff will eventually come. So I, I think that's really admirable. The, I think the Beatles are often talked about in terms of the unique relationship between John Lennon and Paul McCartney. But in your group, you actually have a, an even more unique spin on it in that Michael, who plays the role of John, is actually Frank's son. Is that right? Correct. That's what we tell everyone. Cool. Well, then we have to pick up with Michael's own backstory. What was music like in your household growing up? Well, it's ever present. I mean, I think that was from a unique standpoint. One of your one of your pre questions that I found interesting was when people were saying, "What made you want to become a musician or join a band?" And I had the opposite approach, where I don't think there was ever a moment growing up where I didn't think I was going to be playing music at some point. You know, it was never never made a conscious decision to say, "I'm going to be in a band." It was. I think me and the neighborhood kids formed our first band in the basement when I was about nine. You know, we were very young. It helped, of course, that, you know, my dad was in bands and I had a whole band backline of drums, amps, guitars, microphones, basically in the basement from the time I was in elementary school. So it was very quick to pick up a guitar and learn to play it. Um, and, you know, learned from a young age that, you know, this is something that I was going to do. And um, didn't start, you know, you don't hone your your sort of musical influence and your musical voice until, you know, there's a moment for everyone. And the Beatles came late to me, even though, you know, my dad certainly was a huge influence and there was always Beatles around. He didn't want to shove them down our throat and make us and force us to be Beatle people. So the knowledge of the Beatles was very secondary. My first really big like musical flashbulb was U2. We heard with or without you, the U2 song on the radio um, and I can remember where I was to this day, you know, it was a sunny afternoon. We were about to go over a railroad tracks and the sun came on the radio and it just turned everything I'd ever heard upside down, um, which greatly influenced the way I wanted to sing. And I kind of taught myself to sing in my, in the garage, I'd sneak out there and sing U2 songs or the libretto to Phantom of the Opera to learn how to really project my voice and sing in a big way. Um, and that, you know, led me to, you know, mute, just more and more music. And like I said, it never really stopped. It was always something that was there and just kept growing and growing and growing. And then when the opportunity came to form you know, an actual band and get out and play, um, by that point, I the whole Beatles catalog had evolved in my in my life and. Um, remember one of the first recording in groups that I was in, we had to do a project where we got to record a song that was going to be in a lo like an independent movie. And we did Norwegian wood. Um, and it, it was fun to learn, learn Beatle harmonies in an original way. Um, you know, and that also, as far as for honing yourself and honing your craft, get into a studio and can actually hear, you know, in, in crystal detail how good you're not 
you know, and all the little errors, you are not finishing notes and finishing breaths and finishing phrases, you realize that, you know, oh boy, this is a lot more technical than I thought it was. And, you know, that step from going from pretty good to really good or pretty good to great is, you know, that it's, that's even that is very difficult. I just, uh, let me say one thing about my own son. Um, uh, in his early band efforts, they, uh, we recorded him a lot. In other words, they'd have me go out and videotape them a lot, you know, so I had to go out there and videotape them. And they, I think that helped them also tighten up the band that he was in, one of the bands he was in. It was actually pretty good. I see. That's great. So that's another example, I guess, of where that opportunity to watch or listen back to a recording of yourself gave the opportunity to be a lot more objective and a lot more critical about, you know, the the difference between good enough and really great in your music making. One of the gifts that learning Beatles music and trying to emulate Beatles music has given is learning a lot of ways to approach a note or a chord or a song um, in that the Beatles never did anything easy. They never took the simple route from point A to point B. They purposefully went on a difficult path in order to make the music more interesting. And, you know, it's, it's a constant learning process and we're learning more about how to play the things we're playing on a daily basis. And that, you know, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving. Very cool. And so, Mike, if we come back for a moment to those times when you were sneaking off to belt out songs by yourself, uh, do you have any insights for the people listening who are maybe nervous about singing and can only kind of look with admiration at someone like yourself who's front of stage performing confidently as a singer? How did you go about yeah. becoming that singer? Um, well, I'm a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, it's, I mean, there's a, there's a, a tiny bit of truth to that where anyone who chooses to jump up in front of, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people demanding that they all look at them, you know, Hey, there's, there's a little bit of mental illness, <laughs> but for those who are not so inclined, um, it really comes down to confidence. It's not the confidence in saying, I want people to know that I'm a great singer. It's the confidence in saying, I can do this. And, you know, it's the, it's the, that, not only that belief, but that, you know, the voice is a muscle. So two things have to be done for any muscle to achieve a goal. You need to work and exercise that muscle and you need to use that muscle fully. So for a lot of people who are timid or afraid to go out, and sing, they're very tight. They're very tight in the throat. They're very short, shallow breaths and no projection. And, in order to really sing well, you have to put air through the vocal cords. So you have to breathe deep and push, push from the belly um, and allow the vocal cords to expand and contract and vibrate through the air. And that really only is done when you exercise it right and do it right. And if you're afraid to let that voice out, it's going to be hard to sing. So that's the belief you need is not so much that I'm an awesome singer. It's that I'm going to do this. And I can do this and I'm going to go give it a try. And yes, practice on your own, but you know, you can't be afraid to get out and, and do it and let it out, you know? Terrific. Well, it sounds like Frank and Mike, you both were immersed in music from fairly early on. How about you, Pat? Was music part of your childhood or was it something you came to later? Um, well, me, uh, personally, it was just, it was part of my childhood in the fact that I just like to, uh, hit things. <laughs> <laughs> my, favorite, yeah, my favorite toy was, no, my favorite toy was, uh, bringing out the pots and pans at age, you know, two. So uh, my mom and dad got me a, a toy drum set at age four. And it wasn't that anybody else in the family was musical. It's just, it was just me personally that wanted to do that. And, uh, and then I finally got a real drum set at age 12. That's great. And so your your parents presumably then were supportive, even if they weren't musicians themselves? I think so. I mean, um, they just knew that I that's what I was constantly doing. Um, you know, before I even got drumsticks, I remember I had like two broken pieces from of uh, sticks from, I don't know, like a TV cart that I used to carry around. And, and I would, you know, 
pretend that I was playing drums with it. So they obviously knew that uh, I had a big inclination to do this. So they, they didn't discourage me. That's great. And so did you go on to take lessons or how did you learn drums from there? Yeah, unfortunately, I only took about six months worth, worth of lessons uh, when I was in grade school. And I did learn, I did learn to read a little bit. Um, I then went on to play in the high school marching band and also symphonic band. And a little of there was, there was a, there was a movie out called Drumline, if you've ever seen it. And um, the, the character in there, one of his issues is he's a great drummer, but he, he's not great at reading music and he does it by ear. Well, that's kind of basically my story is that um, I wasn't a great a snare drummer and marching band, but I could pick up, you know, as far as sight reading, you know, a lot of, you know, when you're a marching band and symphonic band, you have to be able to sight read a lot of music. And while I could do it okay, especially if I could get some help and, and, and practice what I was reading, um, more often than not, I just listened to everybody else and, and copied it and was able to copy it. So, um, that was, that was a little bit difficult, you know, as being in high school and you're with these other guys that are really, you know, really good at reading music. Mm, but it sounds like it gave you a, a reason to develop quite a good ear for music if you were relying on that to pick things up to play them right. Right. And it, it probably helped me with the Beatle music because, um, you know, as, 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 you're, as we're trying to uh, duplicate the accuracy of the Beatle music, and you actually have to listen and, and re-listen to, to those parts. You know, what, what's Ringo doing on the bass drum? Well, okay, what's he doing on the snare drum? And, and you actually have to um, pay attention to try to get exactly that, that sound because everybody knows Beatle music, and if it's not accurate, then people are going to know it's not accurate. So I think our job is, is to re replicate it as true as possible. And obviously, that's what I try to do. That's fascinating. Uh, when we talk about uh, dynamics at Musical U, and when we talk about rhythm skills, one point we often make to people is that these are things that the listener is very conscious of, even if they don't realize it. You know, no one comes away from a gig being like, wow, that band had a really tight sense of rhythm. But if the band doesn't have a tight sense of rhythm, they're going to come away sound saying that was not a great band. And I, I guess that kind of accuracy of the way you guys perform the songs is something that subconsciously makes a huge difference to the listener. Would you say that's right? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, we want them to come away with the, with the feeling that um, that's exactly how they remember the song. You know, if we're playing oh, She Loves You, everybody kind of knows how She Loves You goes, but you know, we got to get the harmonies just right. We've got to get the guitar parts just right. We've got to get the the crash of the cymbals just right. And, and obviously tempo and timing as well, but um, that goes more along with how we're feeling. But, <laughs> time, sure. but um, As I'm sure it did for the Beatles themselves, no right. click tracks for them. <laughs> so, Patrick, maybe you can just give us a... Uh, a glimpse into what it would look like you know you you are someone who takes pride in replicating Ringo's drumming very precisely and authentically if you were going to learn a new song from the catalog for a new show what would that look like in terms of sitting down at your drum kit and trying to put together the right rendition well at first i would i would get my headphones out and and listen to the song repeatedly um and I might just concentrate on on an individual drum, for example, like the bass drum. Okay, what's the bass drum doing? And then what's the snare drum doing? And I, I would listen to that over and over. And, and it, nowadays, though, they, they actually have um, they actually have scores. You know, back when we were, I was growing up, they didn't have the Beatles scores that you could actually sit down and, and read the drum music, etc. But nowadays they do. And that help actually helps a lot. And the, the funny thing is, sometimes they're they're about ninety percent accurate. Sometimes they they've made mistakes, I think, in those scores, but um, they do help. And I, along with oh, oh yeah, along with uh, 
and nowadays too, and now that we're getting into anthology and stuff, you can actually, uh, they had, they have isolated, um, tracks, tracks. So they might have a track out on YouTube that just has the bass part or the, or the drum part. And it's, and it's the real Beatles. It's, you know, it's, it's not somebody just doing a cover of their, it's the actual Beatles, um, for example, revolution. And I feel fine has it just Ringo's drums out there. And it's really fascinating to listen to that. And it's much easier to duplicate that when you can just hear the drums by themselves. So, um, but then of course, you know, you, you go along and, and play, uh, you could even, you know, oftentimes I'll play along with the song to get a feeling of the tempo, et cetera, and just the feel of the song. But um, that's my process anyway of at least, you know, starting to learn a new song. Gotcha. Cool. And so would then that just be something that you had memorized and relied on your memory for, or would you be notating down your um, your opinion of what the precise playing was? No, I, 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 would, I don't ever notate it myself. Um, Although we've gotten arguments in the band between ourselves about exactly what's going on there. <laughs> but um, um, I, 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 real, I rel- rely on my memory to, uh, to get the part accurate. And I've heard these songs. I mean, I've literally, I mean, I grew up a Beatles fan, so, and they were the only band that I really listened to. So I've heard these songs hundreds and hundreds of times. In fact, if, if, if Mike or, Frank, say a word wrong, it, it hits me right away because I know it's wrong. <laughs> How do you watch that? <laughs> so, so they, yeah, so they can't get much no. gas. But, uh, <laughs> cool. So with Frank and Michael, clearly, you know, jamming and improvising and being creative was a big part of how they developed as musicians. Um, Patrick, was that something for you? Was there a creative side to your musical development in those high school days? Um, I would just try to write, you know, I, I used to like to try to write songs. I taught myself guitar, I taught myself piano, and I just, I always try to like to write songs. And, um, and this is back in high school, and they're, they're all simple songs, you know, very simple and kind of naive and corny. But I, as the years went by, I noticed that I, I got a little better, and... Um, the songwriting that I wrote got better. And I was, you know, there's stuff that I'm actually pleased with. And I, and I look back on the Beatles career and, it, and it's very similar in that when they started out and even Paul McCartney said this, that, you know, when he and John started writing, their songs weren't very good. You know, they had quite a few clunkers and, but he said, as the years went by, they got a little better at it and more skilled at it. And, uh, you know, and I think it, it is. I think it's true that not only when you grow up, your your songwriting might change um, perspective, but I think you get better at it just because you're practicing at it. I think it's just a pra- just like playing an instrument. I think songwriting is something you have to practice. Yeah, I think they were also studying. You know, when they were in Hamburg or playing in bars, they had to play all the time and they had to just they would learn songs like during their breaks and just keep learning and learning and learning songs so in a sense they were kind of studying or kind of getting schooling without even really knowing that they were they weren't really consciously like oh yes i'm studying this music but you know learning all these songs and being able to play them by memory that kind of i think fed into their songwriting too and learning good stuff you know early rock and roll and early Tin Pan Alley songs and jazz music, you know, that, I think that really played a huge role in their writing as well. Uh, One thing I want to point out too, is when you have a partner or in my case, my younger brother and I would play together and we would write songs too. And, you know, a good uh, technique is having a partner or guys in the band all on the same page who want to write a song or whatever. If you want, sometimes it takes that little bit of teamwork to get you going and start doing something like that when you're thinking of originality. And John Lennon and Paul McCartney worked a lot together early on. Then later on, they wrote their own songs. Yeah, like a, like a communal mind of sorts. Yeah, so for, you know, like Pat, he did it all on his own uh, yeah, in his younger years. I think... And I found out after my brother and I sort of, uh, he went to classical way and I stayed with rock and roll. Um, it was harder to get motivated uh, when I was in college and stuff to write songs. I kind of gave up the, I kind of gave it up because John was so good of a partner 
by John, my John Mirator brother. And uh, if any musician out there has a friend or uh, can get a partnership in a band going, even with all, all the band members, that's a really great thing. Just bouncing ideas back and forth is a great learning experience. That's great advice. And I think for me, it's definitely one of the most interesting and encouraging things to come out of looking at the Beatles and their backstory is that reality that they did not start out on day one incredible songwriters and performers. <laughs> there was definitely a, a long journey of learning their craft. And so it's really interesting, Pat, to hear that you relate to that that journey of songwriting and that you saw it in your own work and and were encouraged by the fact that it was clearly a learned skill, even for the Beatles. Yeah, very much so. They, You know, you think that they kind of learned to do it by emulating the Everly Brothers and Chuck Berry and Little Richard and a lot of the bands that they liked. And they learned to become the Beatles by emulating these other artists. And, you know, we're all standing on the shoulders of somebody's giant. For sure. And so in a moment, I want to dig in a bit more to the music of the Beatles, because I think you guys have a really unique perspective on that. But before that, I, I want to make sure we hear about John's backstory. John, you played George in the group. Could you tell us a bit about your own musical upbringing? Yeah, sure. Um, my sister kind of played, you know, similarly to Frank's story. My sister played in like the middle school and high school band. And then it came time for for me when I was about... Uh, in fifth grade to make the decision to kind of like, well, do I want to do something like that too? Um, so a little bit before that, I had a guitar about in third grade, uh, but really wasn't able to learn much on my own. I just kind of plunk around. And I think I remember it came with like a sheet music of Oh Susanna. And I tried to play that <laughs> and I just couldn't quite, couldn't quite figure it out. So, um, you know, fast forward a little bit to about fifth grade. Uh, one of the earliest events that kind of led me in a musical direction was when the school orchestra teacher came in. Fifth grade in my elementary school was pretty much like, okay, now you decide. Do you do you join orchestra? This was it was like the first experience in my school district where we could, you know, really explore music. Before that, it was just general music class and recorder things like that you know, tapping rhythms and singing things. But fifth grade was the orchestra decision kind of test. And so the school orchestra teacher came into our class and she basically played a game with us. Um, but what I didn't realize, it was really sort of a placement test for the students to see who might fit in the orchestra program or be a good candidate for studying music through middle school and high school. So this game, she played audio recordings for us of melodies, chords, um, different scales, basically like two examples back to back. And we basically had two choices, you know, is this the same or is it different? We just kind of check a box, same or different. And for some reason, I remember for some reason, I really, I wanted to do really well at that test or that game. Um, and from what I remember, I think I did, uh, I don't have the results of the test. I don't think we ever saved those, but um, I remember doing pretty well and kind of getting a good result and the teacher kind of grading our tests at the end. And we would say, you know, like, hey, you should try orchestra or hey, maybe try it later in middle school or something like that. Uh, so I joined the or school orchestra and violin um, and I kind of committed to that with my parents. And for me, the whole motivation to join orchestra was really I wanted to play guitar. Um, and my parents said, well, okay, you know, fine. You can try guitar maybe later, but you have to do, you know, this, you know, serious study of music first. You have to really, it's kind of like that rite of passage kind of thing. I think a lot of parents go through when, when a kid wants to take up an instrument. So did violin for a couple years. And then when I got to about 12, I was about in seventh grade. Um, the option came for me to, you know, Hey, do you want to try out guitar? Or do you want to take some lessons? So I switched to guitar at that point and I was kind of doing both to be honest, like violin and orchestra. I didn't really do well at, I was kind of like last chair most of the time in, in the violin section. But I was, you know, I was always kind of like had the eye on guitar. Like, I want to do that. 
so finally at, at about age 12, I started taking guitar lessons and, and kind of really got hooked into it. And I kept up with violin until about high school, but then guitar just kind of took over from there. Um, and then after that, like I made the decision to go to music school and went to Capitol University uh, in Columbus. Um, and there I studied jazz guitar and contemporary guitar. So it's like a guitar performance major. And where did the Beatles enter the picture? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good question. So the Beatles kind of entered the picture early on. I, I guess I kind of forgot to mention that. Um, I had a friend in about sixth grade, and I'd go to his house, and we'd play pool after school. And um, I remember one day we came down, and we were getting ready to play pool, and he put a stereo or a, a, he put a CD into his stereo and uh, you know, the first sounds that came out were the Sergeant Pepper orchestra sounds. And then Sergeant Pepper just kind of came out and it was like seeing color for the first time, you know, like being transported into a whole new world is really, um, really cool, like vibrant experience hearing that album for the first time. And for me, that album really stuck with me just the sound of it um really kind of brings back that like vivid memory every time i hear it um and then i'd see you know features on tv uh like the beatles anthology when it came out in the 90s i remember seeing that on pbs my parents got the anthology tapes and things like that because that was about the transitional time when tapes and cds were both still kind of around which is kind of cool. Um, but I was really moved by the whole Beatles story. And I remember feeling like an instant connection or a kind of this nostalgia for something that I never really even experienced or lived myself. Like I didn't, I wasn't old enough to have seen them on Ed Sullivan or grow up through the sixties with their music. But, uh, I just remember like getting to the end of that anthology and just kind of being sad and moved in a strange way and kind of wishing that they were still together and even kind of wishing that like John Lennon was still alive. It was kind of a weird feeling, uh, in that, in that regard, but it was an instant connection with the music of the Beatles. So after college and everything, I, that kind of always stuck with me. I, I left that music for a while to study jazz and classical. Um, but then after college, I kind of found myself gravitating toward more toward the Beatles again, like getting into um, the White Album, I think was kind of one of the big albums that I got into after college and just like immersed myself in and listened to day in and day out while I was working on other things. I see. And as George in the band, your guitar skills are obviously, you know, front and center, but you also have to factor in playing sitar on some tracks. Is that right? True. Yeah. So we, um, we kind of came into that endeavor a couple years ago. Um, we play at this event called Abbey Road on the River every year, which is in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Um, and one of the things they started doing in 2016 is they said, okay, we want everybody to try to do, you know, something special for their, for their sets and program your sets in a way that'll be special. So we decided, well, why don't we try a whole album straight through? And 2016 was the 50th anniversary of the Revolver album. So we thought, well, let's, let's pitch that. Let's pitch that to the festival and see what they say. Uh, so we did, we, we said, okay, we're going to do a revolver straight through and, um, listening through the album. We were on, we were actually on a trip to Canada, you know, the whole band was riding up to Canada and we were listening to the album straight through and we got to, uh, love, love you too. Uh, the George Harrison sitar track. So this is the first, well, it's the second track that George Harrison really used sitar on. Uh, we got to that part and we were all kind of like, well, great. You know, what are we going to do there? And so we kind of all started, um, well, maybe you can get a guitar pedal that will sound close. Or maybe you can just play it on guitar and that'll be close enough. And everything I looked at and everything I tried, I was like, well, that's just not, it's just not quite there. Like for me, it just didn't quite do it for me. So I was like, 
kind of kept it a secret for a while. Um, but I was like, in my head, I was kind of like, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try to find a sitar or something. So this is kind of a really cool connection where I live in Columbus, Ohio. There is a sitar instructor who, uh, is pretty well renowned, uh, across the nation, uh, for us. So one of my guitar students at the time had taken sitar lessons from him. So I kind of knew of him. He was kind of close to my circle of, um, you know, people that I knew. So I'd heard about this guy. So I went and found him. He was running an open mic, went out and found him and said, Hey, found him on a set break. I said, Hey, I need to learn sitar. Uh, this was February of 2016. The festival was in May. So I was like, I need to learn sitar uh, in about three months. And he's like, well, you, you could probably do it. He said, George, you know, George was good. He knew what he was doing, but he wasn't really a virtuoso necessarily. He, he knew the right techniques and he could apply them. He's like, but you know, it's attainable. It's accessible for, for, I think for a guitar player of your level right now. I said, great. Um, you know, can we start taking lessons? He's like, yeah, sure. So we took a couple lessons. Um, or I should say we arranged to take some lessons and then, uh, we were talking at that open mic and I also said, well, um, I also need a sitar. I don't have one. And he's like, okay, well, that's fine. You know, I've got, I actually happen to have one right now that my student, one of my former students gave back to me. Um, he's like, I can sell it to you for a really good used price. So I bought that from him, started learning, you know, every day, just like what kind of Frank was saying. And, um, really what all of us have been saying is like, pick it up every day. And I realized I had a pretty uh, heavy task in front of me learning this instrument. So I would sit with it every day and just kind of learn the technique and learn how to actually physically make my body, you know, do the things it needed to do in order to play this. It was a definitely a learning curve definitely more painful on your left hand fingers than a guitar would be. Um, and even on the right hand, there's a little device that you hold on your finger called a Miserab on your, uh, right hand index finger. That's the plucking mechanism. Um, that's like a little, you know, piece of paper clip wrapped around your finger. So it's a pretty painful thing to, to use. I see. And so it was a matter of putting in the daily practice and in that three month window, were you able to get up to speed? It really was. Yeah. And and we did it. We, we pulled it off at that festival. Yeah. So, um, it was just learning, learning the instrument. Um, my background in music theory and, you know, uh, music school and things like that really helped because I knew how to practice and how to practice efficiently I uh, used my time wisely and I was only learning that one song. So I basically had this real heavy focus on this one song, um, you know, where I could, you know, put in that effort. Very cool. On the instrument. Well, John, you mentioned something there that's been a common theme already, which is, you know, putting in the daily effort and the kind of, uh, to put it bluntly, the hard work that goes into such a faithful rendition of the Beatles music. Before we talk a little more about that, I, I'd love if one of you could maybe paint a picture. Um, I think, John, you gave us a little bit of insight there into what might go on at one of your shows. You know, the fact that you were putting together a start to finish rendition of Revolver for one of these festival shows. Um, you did a, a performance at the Cavern Club, the famous place where the Beatles kicked off their career, as it were. Maybe one of you could tell us about that performance and and what you put into that set and what it was like for an audience member to see Hard Day's Night perform there. Uh, that was me and Michael, so I'll, I'll take that. Uh, that was a few years ago. And um, first of all, it was an amazing trip for us to go to Liverpool we played at the Adelphi, we played at the Cavern, Upper and Lower Cavern, and we played at Pete Best's backyard. They had a tent set up there, and Pete Best was there, by the fact. So, number one, we got to meet Pete Best while we were there. Number two, the, uh, the year we played the Beatles Festival at the end of August, they call that Beatles Week, what do you call that? 
International Beatles Week, I think it's called. The um, there were only two American bands there that year, I believe, and we were one of them. So a lot of the audience people came up to us and were very friendly. And when we played the um, we played the Upper Cavern, I think first, I think it was one o'clock on a Saturday or something or a Sunday, I can't remember. And we're walking in, getting ready to play. And it was really early, like in the afternoon, like one or two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm saying to the guy, what are all these people doing lined up out there? And he says, they're here to see you, mate. <laughs> so all these people crowded into the upper cavern. We had a full house. And uh, we played, uh, I don't know, a 90-minute set. And by, by then, I was about ready to go horse. But uh, the people were so nice to us, so friendly. And because we were Yanks, they really uh, they thought it was great that we were imitating the Beatles. But... Um, the other cavern, we played the lower cavern then, and it was very tight stage. It was very hot. Uh, of course, and I don't want to say sweaty, but it was kind of sweaty. And um, it was tight on stage. As a matter of fact, for a left-handed bass player, that's why Paul might have stood in the middle a lot, because if you play the bass left-handed and you're standing where he normally did later on in the years on that side of the stage, you'd ram the bass into the wall a lot. So if you look at the pictures of the, of the Beatles of the Cavern, I think Paul's mostly in the middle of the stage. Anyway, it was a great experience. Um, we got to see all the sights, of course. We got to stay in a house just around the corner from uh, from John Lennon's boyhood home. And uh, was that Walton? Walton? Walton. And uh, Strawberry Fields was just up the road. Um, but to Paul's house, of course, we made the rounds. And uh, it was a great trip. We're thinking about going back, but Going back is always a, uh, a price. It's a cost adventure because we give up local U.S. gigs here to pretty much fund ourselves to go to Liverpool. <laughs> so it's a it's a decision we would do for our own entertainment more than making money. It's not a money thing. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the set listing. Uh, it was just early Beatle rockers. That's the only thing I remember. I yeah, we did uh, long. We did long. We did all the hard stuff: rock, roll, music, long tall Sally, hard days, nights. So we're staying there. Hold your hand. She loves you, of course. Probably did things like uh, you can't do that. Um, you know, most of the stuff from the early 66, 62 to sixty six era. Very cool. And obviously, you know, to be selected for that opportunity is, is evidence of the fact that you guys are among the best Beatles tribute bands in the world. And I, I'd love to hear from your perspective. Why is that? You know, what is it that sets you guys apart from, let's say, the average Beatles tribute band, or even just, you know, the average band that gets together to play some Beatles songs? What what makes the difference between being okay at this and being really world leading? Attention to detail would be one thing I'd say, uh, and that's what Pat mentioned earlier about the songs. In other words, when we go to learn a song, <clears throat> we do strip it down. Uh, for me, I do the Paul, so I, I obviously I listen to the vocal. I, I do it opposite. I listen to the vocal first, and then I go to the bass, uh, the bass parts, and I listen to that, and I work on that. And then when we get together to rehearse, uh, we, we fine-tune it from there. And, you know, John being a musical um, major, music major, we sometimes, we do have that complete Beatles uh, scorebook or whatever, and John will go and look at that, then we'll listen to it, and we'll... You know, we kind of go back and forth, and I think this is what it was. What the note is, this is the chord structure, or whatever. So we do a lot of that uh, in rehearsal and study on our own to the to try and get the attention to detail. And not to mention, we haven't mentioned this yet, but each character in our group spends a lot of time looking at the real Beatles on stage and trying to emulate the stance, uh, how you stand, how you project yourself when you're playing a guitar solo how Ringo moved, and Pat's really Pat's really good with the Ringo moves. Um, that's part of the show, too, so you're not really yourself. I think it takes a while for each member to be comfortable in his own skin to be somebody else on stage, even though, I mean, it's really hard to say that because these are four icons, and we're just four guys. But, um, you know, it's part of, an act, part of an act, but we really try and put the detail in. Yeah, details also, but the other thing that's been lucky for us is we've, I mean, for the last, you know, six, seven years, we've had the same four guys play every show, which for a lot of tribute bands, a lot of bands, it's hard to keep a group together. Um, and that continuity helps immensely to where, you know, most of the time, and there's always little hiccups, but you can see something in each other's eyes and you know, basically, okay, we need to cut this, we need to move to something else, you know, 
little innate intuitive things that you pick up from each other helps the show just flow. And, you know, you, you, and rather than just being a bunch of guys playing a collection of songs, it really becomes a show from start to finish. And that's something that we work very hard at creating a presentation from the first note to the final bow. It's, it, it's an act. So one of the other things that sets us apart is, uh, is the authentic instruments we're using. I mean, um, it would be hard for other people if they were playing modern drum sets or, or modern guitars to actually get the correct sound that the Beatles produced. So I have a set of, you know, 1960s Lud- Ludwig guitars and Zildjian cymbals, the same ones from that era that Ringo used. Ludwig guitars? And, I said drums. Ludwig drums. I'm sorry. Yes, amen. Ludwig <laughs> drums. How many sets do you have, Matt? I have four sets. <laughs> he has four vintage sets. And then, and then the other guys have authentic uh, Rickenbacker guitars, Hoffners, Gretsch. So actually using those instruments is makes the sound that we're making yeah, uh, yeah. very much closer yeah. to what the Beatles sounded like. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's all... Good. We have a 67 Gretsch Country Gentleman, right, Frank? Right. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, we use uh, 13 or 15 guitars in our show. I can't remember. <laughs> too many, right? Wow. <laughs> too many. I have to haul them, so they're too many. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was the big reason why we chose to use the sitar in the show to emulate you know, Norwegian Wood, Love You Too, and Within You Without You is because there's nothing else that when we did our research, there's nothing else that could get that sound. So something had to be done and and that's what you know got us the sound use a sitar but the, <laughs> the visual impact of him playing that sitar is very uh how should i say this it's big i mean the audience really <laughs> is uh, they're surprised by that they're surprised by that yeah. you touched on the visual impact there i believe you know the costuming is also a big part of your attention to detail and authenticity is that right correct so we, I mean, we go through lots of different costume changes. We obviously have the uh, the early suits, and then we have uh, the what we call the Shea jackets, which they wore at Shea Stadium, and and then of course the Sergeant Pepper outfits, which are and to get into that, uh, you know, they all had mustaches at that point and different type, you know, longer hair. Cyber. <laughs> yeah. So, so all that, yeah. We, not only do you have to pay attention to the music you have to pay attention to their to their wardrobe and how they looked as well so it's uh it's, yeah, a, it's that's a challenge hard. That's a really, <laughs> i mean that's that stuff's hard to really get right you know it's uh, well as as john john ocker as george at one time you were wearing that full beard remember that yeah. beard you'd have to take on your, your the Abbey on Road with a full beard on and the big long wig <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, the clothing does add some somewhat to the visual effect, and um, the correct instruments also help. Yes. Terrific. Well, I, I definitely recommend our listeners go have a look on your website and on YouTube, because I think you have to see these costumes in action to, to understand just how powerful it is visually that you guys recreate the, the, the look of it as well as the music. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that that's maybe touching on something I was keen to ask, which is... All of you guys have played at a high level in non-Beatles groups. You know, you've performed in bands in in varied genres. And I, I'd love to know, you know, what is it that's different about playing in Hard Day's Night? What is it that it brings out of you as a musician that other musical projects maybe don't? I think there's more, there's more leeway. In a, you're playing in a, a band doing original music or a band doing covers of the top 40 going back, I mean, back when there was a top 40 you could put it, replicate. You had a lot more leeway. You had a lot more leeway in that. I mean, because you were a nightclub band, um, not a concert band. In the Hard Day's Night, we're, we're doing mostly concert shows, and the focus from the audience is really pinpointed to the four guys on stage. When you're doing a nightclub show in a bar or whatever it is, it's just backup music or dance music. And the people are more concerned about having a good time dancing, drinking, whatever. They're not concentrating on you, the performer at all. And you rarely get even applause after the songs in a bar. But here we're doing a performance. People applaud. I recognize what you're doing. Looking at it from an original band standpoint, you know, when you're playing your own songs, your own creations, 
or original music, it like you, it's a lot more open ended. Meaning, if I want to change some lyrics or change a chord progression or throw in a different solo, not only do people not care, but sometimes people that are fans of the band might find that exciting. Whereas what we're doing now, especially the Beatles music, is so part of the pop culture and so part of the zeitgeist that it you really want to try to be accurate. And people expect accuracy and relentless precision. They want to hear what was what the source material was. So um, replicating that in an accurate way while still being live, electric, and exciting is the challenge that we take on. And you know, I'd say Frank and I definitely push the envelope on being you know on, on being raw and live and okay pat and john are better at keeping us on track <laughs> and not straying too far yeah the purest mentality right yeah i i mean for me it's it's kind of like multifaceted like like music if you're gonna play music there's so many avenues you can go and there's so many facets uh of your musicality that you can tap into uh, so for me, it's, it's almost like personality, personality, like whenever I play with other groups, uh, other, other music nights, I'm in a house band at a place called 31 West. And we do, uh, big tribute nights that are basically just go out and play the songs of, um, you know, a legendary songwriter. When we do that, it's a little more loose and we can provide our own interpretation. I think there you can put more of your own personality into the music and you can kind of tell your story. Um, when I play at church, it's like we have to play the original arrangements of the recordings there and it's just play the part and go like a, like a touring musician would if they were playing with, you know, uh, a large tour like Justin Timberlake or Lady Gaga or Katy Perry or something like you play the part and that's it. Um, and maybe that's a little bit, some musicians might feel that that's stifling, you know, I don't get to be creative in that regard, but it's all just playing a part. For me, the Beatles, such a strong connection with everybody and every, everybody takes a meaning from one of their songs. So yes, we're, we're being purists and we're playing the exact parts and we're playing, I'm, I'm seeing the exact part George would have sung. I'm playing the exact guitar part George would have played. But at the same time, it's connecting with that. What's that song mean to people? And what's that song mean to me? What's the story of the song? And can I bring that emotion every time into the song and give that to people, you know, and give that, give that feeling to the people when they first heard that song, either blaring through a stereo or on TV on Ed Sullivan or something like that, that excitement and that energy. And the notes don't change, but that amount of feeling we can put into it changes. Very cool. So we've, we've talked a bit about the kind of showmanship involved and also the, the hard work and attention to detail that goes into the performances you guys put on. I'd love to step back and just talk a little bit about the music of the Beatles as a listener, as a fan, because you have probably listened to this music in more detail, in more depth than, you know, even the most rabid fans. So I'd love to, to hear your insights and ideas and opinions about what it is that makes the music of the Beatles so worth forming a tribute band around. Like, why is this one of the, if not the band of the 20th century? What makes them so special? This is Pat. Pat. Um... One is that they they have such a vast body of, of work that's that's great. Uh, you know, you can you can maybe you can form a tribute band out of uh, I don't know uh, several other groups, you know, uh, ACDC or whatever. But they don't have the body of the work the Beatles did. And not only that, but it's interesting in the fact that the Beatles you can break it down into like three three at least three possibly four different segments of 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 musical era, eras. Um, I mean, they had had an early era. They had this Sergeant Pepper where they totally come on as a different type of group. And then they had their, their later period where the, the songs are, are vastly different and there's a lot more piano and there's a lot more orchestration. So it, it keeps it interesting, not only for us, but I think it keeps it interesting for, for the public. 
Yeah, you know, and then and then what you asked, what makes the Beatle music special, or whatever, to any one of us, and I have to say that it's somehow everybody has a personal connection to the songs when they listen to it. When I listen to the Beatles, uh, I uh, somehow I imagine them in the studio doing it, and I also imagine them singing to me. In other words, and how I, my life relates to some of the words of their song, and I, that seems to go on with some of the people who come see us play. They they have certain songs that are like therapy to them, um, and it's just a personal attachment to their lives. And uh, I suppose it's our, we're that way too because I think everybody in this band's a real fan of the Beatles. I don't know that we would do this if we weren't a big fan of the Beatles. Oh, yeah, happy for the money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have to you have to be a fan. I mean, to put this much relentless obsession into you know buying all the guitars and the costumes and the wigs and the uh, this learning the stance and you know the the out of body experience that comes with learning to try to perform as somebody else. Yeah, you have to have a deep enjoyment and passion for the music. And you know the the Beatles have such a wide catalog that they appeal to a wide range of people. So it's easy to get four guys together that love the music. Um, and I bet it, you know, you, you pull us all and we all have probably have different favorite eras of the Beatles, let alone favorite songs. It, you know, it creates for a fun dynamic. Um, and there's a, there's a, a, an amazing hunger for it with an audience where you see it reflected back at you every time you play. So it's a hugely rewarding experience for both the band and the audience. And we really share in this love of the music. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's like they were a groundbreaking band. There's the history behind it, all the legend and the lore behind it that plays, I think, a huge role. The fact that they are a, you know, a really high selling band, the highest selling band of all time. You know, th- those things I think keep the appeal going. The fact that, um, you know, generationally, like parents have their kids listen to the music of the Beatles, and that those kids have their kids listen to the music of the Beatles. So it's just something that's continued on from generation to generation too. So that's, that's what keeps it. I think, you know, having that high appeal, um, and hopefully high demand, you know, knock on wood, hopefully for years to come. Yeah. The front, some of these younger, the young fans, uh, who have become fans of the Beatles, the younger people say maybe what, 30 to 10, <laughs> it's all new and fresh to them. And they really, they kind of appreciate the fact of seeing a tribute band do a good job live because they, they'll never get a chance to see the Beatles live, obviously. And as nobody else will, my point is there's a, there's a turnover of fans that are young, younger coming along and they're big fans. They buy the records and everything. So it's uh, when I started doing this 20 years ago, I thought, eh, it'll last, you know, five years, 10 years or something like that. But there we, I've been doing it for 20 years other groups we know out there have been doing it for 30 years. So it's been, uh, it just keeps going and which we're very happy to hear that. And I think everybody takes that personal, um, relationship when they hear the songs, they feel a personal relationship with the Beatles. Yeah. I think what you said is important too, that you know, the fact that you can't see the Beatles live right now, like the a tribute band is the only way, to see something close to the Beatles live in concert nowadays. Well, it might be less expensive. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I was joking to Adam from our team earlier today that I was really looking forward to interviewing the Beatles. So I can certainly relate to that thrill of getting to see as close to the Beatles live as it's possible to get these days. And I thoroughly enjoyed watching your videos online um, on the harddaysnight.net website and on YouTube. And it definitely made me envious of those in the States who get to see you guys perform live. I'd love if you could share a little bit about where people can go to learn more about your band. Well, there's the website. John, John, why don't you say all the things we have? We have the website, (laughs) www.net. Go from there. Sure, yeah. So we've got the website, www.harddaysnight.net. Uh, from there, there's direction to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. So our Facebook is uh, Facebook slash HDN Tribute. Our Twitter is HDN Tribute Band. So these are all our uh, social media tags, right? Facebook is HDN Tribute. 
Instagram is HD and Tribute. You can go to YouTube slash user slash HD and Tribute. And then finally, Twitter at HD and Tribute Band. Um, so those are the main those are the main ways to find out about us. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I, I definitely encourage our listeners to go watch some of the videos on YouTube and uh, give them a like or a follow on Facebook or Twitter so you can stay up to date on the latest. Uh, I think you guys are fantastic in the performances you put on. And I, I next time I'm in the States, I'm going to be looking up your tour dates because I would love to see you live myself. It has been a real pleasure to get to talk to you all. And thank you for sharing these insights, both into your own journeys as musicians and into the world of the music of the Beatles. It's been a really unique conversation. And I'd just love to thank you all for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having us. Talk, Chris. Yes, thank you. <laughs> cool. I don't think I've ever had a tar from a guest before. Very nice. Would you like to hear more, enjoy more, and understand more in every piece of music you listen to? Active listening holds the key, and we're about to launch an exciting, brand new way to learn active listening, step by step, with music of every genre and era, including the Fab Four themselves. For full details, visit musicalitypodcast.com slash hear more. That's musicalitypodcast.com slash hear more, where you'll also get access to an exclusive time-limited special offer. Act fast and visit musicalitypodcast.com slash hear more today.